Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this summary presentation of the Better Said project and a discussion about how patient partners can improve joint replacement research. This project is a partnership of the RAND Corporation with the Global Healthy Living Foundation and its arthritis patient community, Creaky Joints, and specifically Arthritis Power or AR Power, which is a Procornet patient powered research network. Uh, created by Creaky Joints and Rheumatology researchers uh, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, our, our partners on the PPRN, uh, and with support from the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, Institute or PCORI. Um, we have some colleagues here uh, that I'll uh, quickly introduce. Um, my name is Ben Knoll. I'm the Director of Patient Centered Research at the Global Healthy Living Foundation Creaky Joints. I'm also a co-PI for Arthritis Power, our patient-powered research network. Uh, we're joined uh, by uh, Tom Kincannon, who is uh, a senior policy researcher at RAND and also on faculty at Tufts University School of Medicine. He's a co-lead with me on the Better Said Project. Uh, we're also joined by Chris Stake, who is our patient partner on this project. Uh, Chris is an arthritis power patient governor, um, and she came to us uh, during the course of the, of the Better Said project of this engagement award. Um, she had a hip replacement herself as a result of osteoarthritis. Um, she's also done research in orthopedics, uh, but uh, for the sake of this discussion, she'll be um, speaking from the patient voice as a stakeholder in, in that way. Uh, we're also joined today by Shilpa Venkatachalam, who's our project manager for Better Said. She's a research uh, assistant director at the Global Healthy Living Foundation, Creaky Joints, um, uh, with me in New York City. Um, so again, the project was funded through a Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, Eugene Washington PCORI Engagement Award, uh, and we were funded for the 2015 through 2017 uh, project period. So a couple things to note, um, this webinar will last about 90 minutes. We'll be recording the webinar uh, and we'll make the, the webinar available on the Creaky Joints website afterwards. Um, so in case folks have missed it or you'd like to share this webinar with folks who did miss it, um, there'll be a link that we'll send out to everyone. We'll, we'll not have everyone introduce themselves, all the participants in this webinar. However, there will be some time for uh, Q&A for questions and answers during the webinar. So um, you're welcome to speak up that way or use the chat window in the webinar to ask questions at any time and, and uh, I'll function as a sort of facilitator or MC to make sure the questions get answered. Um, if, uh, if you're calling in by phone, um, if you could put your phone on mute um, when you're not speaking just to minimize the, the background noise. All right, so our agenda for this webinar um, is, uh, is as follows. So first of all, what does Better Said stand for? It stands for bringing stakeholders together for engagement in research for the selection of arthroplasty implant devices or Better Said. So in this webinar, we'll first give an overview of, of what Better Said is, what the project uh, aims were and, and kind of the bigger picture. We'll share with you uh, what we learned uh, the findings that uh, that uh, that we gathered during the uh, the webinars and the roundtables that we conducted, and we'll uh, hear from a couple of guest speakers about how patient partners can improve research. So we'll look at a couple examples or models uh, from uh, from Nest uh, with Rachel Florence, and also from uh, treatment guidelines uh, from Susan Goodman. So I'll introduce them a bit later um, before they speak. By the end of this webinar, we'll leave you with a call to action to engage patients as partners in joint replacement research. And we'll hopefully you'll have some ideas for doing so, um, both through the examples or models that will be presented, but also through some of the suggestions and framework that, that, we'll, uh, that we'll propose. The purpose of this call is to share a summary of our Better Said project, what we learned, and to make sure that you, um, other researchers, other stakeholders, and patients are aware of the Better Said cohort of patients um, who are motivated and prepared to work as research partners. 
Uh, so it's really our vision that we keep our better said cohort of, of patient ambassadors, patient partners, um, so busy that they don't know what to do with themselves over the next few years. So, um, so we'll hear from just a minute um, from our co-facilitator, Chris Stake, who's a, a member of that better said patient cohort and actually a great example because she's already been tapped uh, to work on a study um, that we're conducting right now about expectations of total knee replacement surgery. So what is better said? As I mentioned before, better said stands for bringing stakeholders together for engagement and research for the selection of arthroplasty implant devices. And just to back up a little bit, Creaky Joints, our patient community for arthritis, was created to give the community of arthritis patients and their families a voice. Uh, so part of that includes getting a wider circle of patients involved in the research that can bring about real changes in healthcare, in their own treatment, and in their own health outcomes and health outcomes for others, such as helping patients get optimal treatment to manage arthritis, inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, um, and to make sure they can get the, the best possible outcomes from their hip or knee joint replacement. From some early discussions with patients and other stakeholders as we were preparing to launch this Better Said project, uh, device selection, so the, the artificial knee or hip, um, that device selection emerged as a major factor in joint replacement safety. Um, and we believe that the choice of which device to use is an important healthcare decision that can be guided with better evidence. And as you'll hear in just a minute, uh, some of the findings from our discussions on webinars and roundtables uh, confirm that that is an important choice uh, for the patient community. An underlying assumption of this project and this webinar is that patients should be involved as partners in research. It's the right thing to do, and it, it improves the quality and usefulness of, of the findings from research. So to tell you a little bit about specifically what we did with Better Said, we engaged stakeholders in three steps. Um, our primary stakeholder was patients. Um, so the first step was that we held interactive webinars to explore patient decisions and their information needs prior to surgery. Um, with step two, we conducted in-person roundtables to observe the responses of, of other stakeholders like clinicians um, to the patient decisions and information needs. And then we, in this third step, we're, dissemin we're doing this summarizing webinar and we'll disseminate the information from this project um, so that other people are aware of this. So uh, another underlying assumption of this project is that research produces information that helps people, uh, patients and other stakeholders in healthcare, make decisions, right? So information, research produces information that helps people make a decision. So in, in other words, ideally research can help people make decisions uh, to improve their health outcomes, but not all research does that very well. So in our project, we wanted to, to do these three steps in order to build a cohort of trained and activated patient research partners who could be involved in helping to generate uh, research and help uh, conduct research and help uh, also disseminate findings from research. So through the webinars, we wanted to make sure patients understood how they can play an essential role in all phases of research, before research, during research, and after. And the message we conveyed also was that the decisions that patients find most important can actually be turned into powerful research questions that could be studied um, by research teams. Through the in-person roundtables at step two, we wanted to help prepare patients to sit at the table, to work alongside other stakeholders. So, um, you know, when you're in a room full of scary surgeons or health systems leaders or, or researchers from high-powered universities, that patients feel like they're ready, that they feel like they know they have an expertise to share um, to contribute on these research teams. Um, we also wanted to share some of the decisions and questions that patients had to this diverse group of stakeholders and do some uh, multi-stakeholder analysis of a few of those critical decisions uh, to, to demonstrate that patients are ready to participate as members and partners of research teams. So uh, with that, we, um, we wanna share with you what we learned. So we listened closely during the webinars and, and collected some great information during the process, although this wasn't explicitly a research project, um, these engagement awards are really more considered pre-research, we actually um, learned a lot that we wanted to share and, and collate. 
um, during the, these webinars and patient roundtables and with other stakeholders. So I'm gonna uh, pass it off to Chris Stake, our patient representative here, um, to share these findings. Hi, um, as Ben said, my name is Chris, um, and for this project, I attended a roundtable session, and I have had um, a total hip replacement, um, and I'm proud to represent the patient perspective. So um, for people considering joint replacement surgery, um, some of the issues that came out as important for the majority of the group were people wanted to be informed about the specific implant device that would be used in their surgery. Several people of almost three-fourths or 75%, 71 to be specific, wanted to hold or see a model of their device. 88% um, were interested in learning about the risks and benefits associated with surgery, and 88% um, wanted to learn about existing devices on the market. Now, when we looked at that ex with the expectations compared with patients' to actual experiences, there was a big contrast. So when we looked at patient experiences for people who had had joint replacement surgery, the percentages for these same issues were much lower. So only 63% were informed about the specific implant device. Even lower, 34% saw or held the device. Half of the patients learned about the risks and benefits associated with surgery, and only 18% of the patients learned about other devices. So let's think about what we're saying here for a minute. So when we toggle back or look at the first information, the expectations were very different. So when we look at, for most of those issues, almost nine out of 10 people wanted more information about the implant advice, they wanted to know more about risks and benefits, and they wanted to know more about existing devices on the market. And almost seven out of 10 people wanted to see or hold a model of their device. Now, when we look at actual patient experiences, patients who actually went through this whole process and had surgery, the percentages were much lower. So only six out of 10 people were actually informed about the specific implant device that was going to be used in their body. Only three out of 10 people actually saw or held the device. Half of the people learned about the risks and the benefits associated with the surgery, and only two out of 10 people learned about other devices. So from the patient perspective, the device replacing their hip or knee is an important decision that we wanted that they wanted to know more about and the patient's expectations for what they want to learn about this device does not match their actual experience when they have surgery. Now this is important information that is crucial that we um, is gathered through patient-centered research and that many researchers could have only gained by engaging with um, patients. So we also looked at which decisions need more information. So in the 16 webinars that were held with 49 patients and caregivers, um, they also asked patients what decisions were most important to patients related to either their knee or hip arthroplasty. And from this, eight main decisions emerged. So the decisions that, were, um, um, that the patients identified were surgery, the timing of the surgery, surgeon, which, you know, who would perform the surgery, facility where the surgery would take place, the device or implant that would be used, the approach um, of the surgery for, for example, in hip replacement, you can have an approach that is done um, on the front of the hip, one can be done posteriorly on the back or one on the side with different risks and benefits. Other healthcare providers that would be involved such as anesthesia or rehab facilities and other services. An example of the other factors that patient identified that were important were their current life situation and health status. Did they have other diseases or conditions that influenced their decision or other responsibilities in their life, like a caregiving role that influenced their decision? The risks and benefits of having surgery versus not having surgery. Um, information provided to the patient by the doctor, other healthcare provider, or other people um, in their life alternatives to surgery, such as physical therapy or injections, information provided, and trust and communication with their healthcare provider, and firsthand familiarity with the procedure, the facility, and the surgeon. Now, 
we want to say that this was a convenient sample of participants who signed up for our webinars and the number of people that that was was around 60 but we do um, want to say that it does um, elucidate a pattern um, about the wants of the patients and the actual experiences. So which decisions need more information? We talked about those eight decisions. Then the one we are focusing on for this project was the device, more information about a device. So what's interesting about a device is it's because patients had a lot of questions about the devices, but they did not get a lot of information. For example, patients wanted to know, how does a doctor or surgeon choose the device? what factors do they use about devices? What materials are out there for devices? Situations are virtual. So how do I know this is the right device for me? What devices or materials work best or get the best outcomes for patients? And what about price? Does that affect the device or how many surgeons use it for joint replacement? And is the latest device always the best? Why or why not? What does the data show? How can I know this information? So now I'm going to turn it over to Ben, who is going to talk about um, the stakeholder analysis. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so yeah, as, as Chris mentioned, she just walked through these devices that emerged as, as being very important uh, to patients. So during the the so the the eight decisions we actually identified through the webinars that we conducted, um, the 16 webinars that we did, and then when we brought people together for in-person uh, roundtable meeting uh, in three different cities in Chicago and New York City and also Boston. We, Tom Kincannon, um, something we called the seven P's framework. Um, so this was developed by Tom and, and colleagues and it was published in the Journal of, Gen Journal of General Internal Medicine under the title a new taxonomy for stakeholder engagement in patient-centered outcomes research. So this seven piece framework, you see, you see kind of a version of it here on this slide. Um, it's used to identify different stakeholder groups that should be included in a health outcomes research project. So what we did in the roundtables is we took some of those different decisions that were identified in the webinar and we looked at, uh, we, well, we asked the group actually to, to, to answer these questions, who's involved and what information does each stakeholder group uh, need to make that decision? So um, this, this slide gives an example of the device question. So the, the decision is which device or appliance will be used in joint replacement. Um, and what participants realize and what you see on the slide is that providers primarily make the device decision and that makes sense, right? Providers meaning surgeons or doctors are typically the ones choosing the device. Um, and there are other, um, stakeholders as, as well from the seven P's framework that, that may have a say in the device, but it's really primarily the provider making that decision is what people felt and understood. But patients also realize that they are a first order stakeholder affected by the device decision. So this makes sense given that um, you know, a patient is the person who has to um, live with the device uh, and that unfortunately, uh, occasionally faulty devices can end up on the market and cause serious adverse events for patients. So for the majority of cases, of course, uh, patients have pretty successful joint replacement, um, all goes well, but when it doesn't go well, that's, that can have a major impact on a patient's life. Um, so given that some patients must undergo revision surgery, it's, it's certainly a, device, and a decision, the device decision is an important one that patients want to be more for, informed about, even though they realize they're not the ones ultimately making that final device decision. So I'll pause there. That's uh, given an overview on the uh, Better Said project, the webinars and roundtables, and what we learned. Um, you heard from both, both Chris and I about some of the findings and activities um, of, of Better Said. Um, and take, before we move on to some examples and models of how patient partners can be in, involved in research, and how they can improve research. I uh, just want to take a moment to pause for, for questions uh, or comments. Um, so please feel free to take yourself off mute and chime in or, or ask a question in the chat window. And we'll have some time for Q&A a little later as well.
Okay. If there's no questions, um, we will move on. So we invited a couple of uh, of our friends from uh, friends of Creaky Joints of the organization to speak about why it's important to include patients as partners, and also to share some models or examples of how this can be done in research that's related to joint replacement. So in this in this space of medical devices, in the space of arthroplasty or joint replacement. So we have two presenters, and our first presenter is Rachel Florence, Dr. Rachel Florence. So Rachel is the former director of PCORnet, which is the National Patient-Centered Clinical Research Network, um, of which Arthritis Power, the PPRN, is, is part. Um, and PCORnet was created to address an urgent national need, essentially to conduct patient-centered outcomes research faster, more efficiently, and at lower cost by leveraging the power of health data and unique patient partnerships. Uh, Rachel, as she'll describe uh, in just a moment, is now the Executive Director of the National Evaluation System for Health Technology, or NEST, Coordinating Center, which is a public-private partnership of the FDA and the device industry located at MDIC, or the Medical Device Innovation Consortium. So Dr. Florence will speak to us um, about NEST, um, people may not be familiar with it, and also about the relevance of NEST coordinating center for the arthroplasty community of stakeholders, which of course includes patients, clinicians, researchers, the FDA, the medical device industry. Um, and she'll also describe a bit the importance of bringing patients and other, other stakeholders together to improve evidence generation in the area, specifically of medical devices, which is very relevant for Better Said, since that was an important decision that came up um, in our discussion. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to, um, to Rachel. Uh, thank you, Ben, and it's a real um, pleasure to be on a webinar for uh, Creaky Joints uh, since I spent, as you said, the last five years of my career at PCORI um, helping to build out uh, PCORnet, um, and our power and Creaky Joints have been um, very strong players in that, in that field, and so it's um, a great pleasure for me to be uh, working with you again now in my, in my new capacity. Um, as the executive director of NEST. So, um, so in some ways I've moved over to, a, um, to the medical uh, device field, but really with the same goals um, that we've all been working together, which is really to improve evidence generation for the benefits of uh, the patients that will be uh, using and choosing these interventions, whether in the med medical device area or in, in other types of interventions. So, um, so it's uh, nice for me today to be able to present uh, NEST to this community. NEST is a fairly new initiative, although it's been um, under uh, planning and under preparation for a few years. It's um, a partnership and a sort of that's uh, out of the FDA and the medical device industry. It's, it was created to uh, support better, faster, cheaper evidence generation specifically for medical devices. Um, throughout the total product life cycle of the medical device, so from the early conception right through to the sort of end life of the device. Um, and all this is done for uh, the patients' communities, the clinicians and surgeons who use these medical devices, the medical device industry who creates the um, devices, as well as regulatory agencies that have the tough task of, of making these regulatory approvals in the face often of limited evidence. The mission overall of NEST is to ensure safety for patients, first and foremost, uh, to expedite access to safe and effective medical devices, and to enable innovation for the medical device industry. So all of these goals are part or sort of woven into the mission of NEST around supporting better evidence generation in the medical device area. Uh, next slide. Uh, so a little bit of history, in, in September of last year, September 2016, the FDA awarded a, a $3 million grant uh, for the NEST Coordinating Center to a, an organization called uh, MDIC, the Medical Device Innovation Consortium. Um, and after this first year grant, there's an expected $6 million per year for five years, and that, that'll be through the MEDUFA agreements uh, that are currently being um, approved in Congress. So uh, NEST really is envisioned as a partnership between different key stakeholders in the ecosystem to <coughs> support the
this improved evidence generation for, around medical devices. Um, next slide. Um, the, the big picture vision will be very familiar to those of you on this um, webinar, and it's very consistent with the work that we did uh, with PCORnet, and it's really to support this paradigm shift um, to support uh, better evidence generation and to resolve challenges that are that currently sort of plague our current system. Um, and here are some here are some um, examples that are more specific to the medical device um, area. So it's uh, moving from this passive surveillance that we currently have to a more active real-time surveillance. So having a system in place that leverages the electronic health data and allows uh, patients and their clinicians to know um, what's going on with their devices and to sort of hear um, more about that in real time than what the current system currently allows. Uh, secondly, it's to leverage better, faster, cheaper uh, real-world evidence to support regulatory decisions. So um, the sort of the, the aspirational goal that we've had in PCORnet and, and um, is true in many different kind of networks right now, which is to be able to use electronic health data generated in the course of clinical care to do better research. Uh, thirdly is, um, as I alluded to, is making better use of this data that generated in care, um, but also generated by patients themselves to be able to support um, a number of, of decisions, both regulatory decisions, big picture decisions, but also decisions for patients and their clinicians and surgeons. Um, and the goal as well is to move away from these really lengthy, one-off, uh, cost-prohibitive studies to an ecosystem that really supports more routine evidence generation um, and provides that better, faster, cheaper evidence to the communities that need it. Uh, next slide. Um, just, this, just a brief kind of um, big picture slide around the different sources of real-world data that can support this paradigm sh shift, but also remembering that as much as we do have a proliferation of data sources, the robust and strong analytic methods are essential. So, um, so in some ways, there's a risk with the proliferation of all this data in, um, in um, actually not having the right methods to support the inferences around what works for, for whom and under which, which conditions. Um, so this slide just gives you a a kind of an overview of, of how many uh, real-world data sources are, are out there from the um, from the electronic health record to the administrative data in claims as well as all the uh, data that patients are now uh, generating uh, themselves. Um, next slide. Uh, we, we um, so, so as part of my um, my new engagement here, we did a sort of a quick landscape review of where um, where most studies were taking place using real world evidence in the medical device area. And what I wanted to show you today on the webinar is that um, orthopedics is certainly up there. It is behind the cardiovascular space, which really has most of the device uh, studies using real world evidence. But um, orthopedics is a close uh, se second there. And um, in terms of the um, uh, the, the sort of the disease area, and um, and I hope to sort of be able to support more uh, projects and and um, explorations in that space. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just um, just to let you know that um, the the Nest Courting Center is really just launching as I speak and we'll be looking how to explore ways to improve evidence generation for medical devices over the next uh, year. Uh, the developments I think that NEST can support will be of interest to many stakeholders, um, to patients and clinicians, but also to the medical device industry, the payers, regulators, and hospitals. Uh, the involvement and support from the patient community uh, in all aspects of the work will be very important for success and certainly um, I learned uh, from many of you on this webinar and from my colleagues at PCORI uh, many ways to, to do that and was and I'm really um, keenly aware of the importance of um, patient engagement and patient involvement in all this aspects of this work. 
Um, my short-term goals as I start this new um, launch are just to put some governance in place, and that will be done over the summer. There'll be a multi-stakeholder board, including a strong patient representation. Will be to identify some key demonstration projects to show some proof of concept, um, and finally to develop a sustainability plan for the Nest Coordinating Center itself. So um, on that note, I um, that's uh, the end of my uh, formal presentation, and I look forward to your questions and to working with many of you um, in the future as Nest uh, develops. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rachel. Um, so we'll pause here for. Um, uh, some Q&A. So are there any questions out there for uh, for uh, Rachel about Nest Coordinating Center? Um, you know, again, please chime in or if you want to put a question in the chat window. I guess one question, or it's more, I guess, a comment, uh, Rachel, is as you're putting governance in place and looking for uh, patient representatives, um, I'd invite you to look toward the Better Said cohort uh, to identify some some patient partners who maybe um, great additions to your, your governance. Uh, thank you for that, Ben. And I think uh, sort of keeping our relationship going and as we form not only the, the governance committee, but also some work groups, um, I think you and uh, your community will be a great resource for that. The, the nomination process is actually closed for the governing committee. So, um, so we're in the final stages there of making the selections, uh, but there will be work groups in the future. Great, thanks, that's good to know. Uh, any questions for, uh, or comments for, um, for, for Rachel? Okay, great, so we'll, uh, we'll move on to our, oh, sorry, uh, Leroy uh, Kruger, it looks like in the chat window, um, how, I guess a question for Rachel specifically, how, how can patients become involved uh, with the NEST uh, Coordinating Center? I think, Leroy, chime in if, if I'm uh, misinterpreting your question, but that's what I see in the chat box. Yeah, so thank you for your question, and um, it's still very much early days, so I think the, the, first, um, the first is just to kind of uh, follow some of the developments as we, as we uh, launch our governing committee in the summer. Um, and then um, we'll have more formal ways to engage with uh, different patients and foundations and, and groups. So um, I'm, I'm only four weeks on the job, and um, so I apologize that I don't have kind of a better, more formal mechanisms for engagement in place yet. Um, this is sort of just an early opportunity to let you know about NEST and um, hope that you'll sort of stay tuned to the, to the developments um, and and wait for some more formal mechanisms for, for engagement. Uh, but there certainly will be um, patient uh, representation on the governing committee. We've had some very solid um, applications from the uh, patient community. And so um, off the bat, our governing committee will have uh, patient representation. Thank you for your question. Great, thanks, Rachel. Uh, all right. so. Uh, chime in if there are any other questions. Otherwise, I will move on. Uh, so our second presenter today is Dr. Susan Goodman. Uh, she's a rheumatologist at the Hospital for Special Surgery, or HSS, in New York City. And she specializes in treatment of patients with inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and spondyloarthritis. And her other area of specialization is in the paraoperative care of patients with rheumatic diseases. So her research interests have, have also focused on that area in, in paraoperative outcomes or outcomes uh, you know, around surgery um, of rheumatic disease patients undergoing arthroplasty. Um, so personally, I, I had heard of Susan Goodman, uh, Dr. Goodman by reputation uh, before actually meeting her, and, and I know she's a leader within uh, the American College of Rheumatology kind of community, national community and international community of rheumatologists um, in terms of development of treat, treatment guidelines. So she'll talk about her work with patient panels for uh, clinical treatment guidelines and specifically for medication management for people with inflammatory arthritis who are undergoing a, a joint replacement surgery. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Susan. 
Thanks, Ben. That's a lovely introduction. And I wanted to say how pleased I was to be invited to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, Creaky Joints has become a really significant uh, player in uh, putting the patient perspective into the front lines. And I'm really delighted to be collaborating with your group. Uh, next slide, please. So the particular project I'll be talking about was a uh, joint study uh, by the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons and the American College of Rheumatology to create a guideline for the perioperative management of anti-rheumatic medications in patients with rheumatic diseases undergoing elective hip or knee arthroplasty. Now, we wanted to uh, create this guideline because we know that for our patients with rheumatic diseases, uh, there is a significant risk for infection over that of other patients uh, when they undergo hip or knee replacement. Since we know that the vast majority of these patients uh, at the time of surgery are taking potent disease-modifying drugs, we thought that medication management might be one way to mitigate that risk of infection. Now, we also knew that uh, there wasn't a lot of really clear data in this subject, but we felt that guidance was nonetheless needed because arthroplasty for patients with rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile arthritis is such a, a frequent um, event. Up to 30 to 50% of patients with these diagnoses will undergo some sort of orthopedic procedure over the course of their lifetime. Next, next slide, please. So we originally got together the uh, two groups of stakeholders, orthopedists and rheumatologists, but we realized that, of course, patients are major stakeholders as well. One of the factors that led us to um, be so clear in our desire to include patients was a growing recognition that patients and doctors can have quite different priorities for outcomes and risks of therapies. In fact, when it's been formally studied, it turns out that physicians are only able to identify their patient's choices for the most important outcomes about 50% of the time. So clearly, uh, we have different perspectives. We also assume that once you've taken patients' preferences into account, this is going to lead to a better compliance, adherence with medication regimens, and ultimately satisfaction with the results of therapy. So it, it seems like, and I think in rheumatology, we're very aware of this since the illnesses uh, can expand over 30 years, that this really is a partnership. Next slide, please. So I, I like this slide because it so clearly um, gives in a, a picture perspective how perspectives vary between healthcare providers on the left and patients on the right. And what this uh, illustrates is the features that healthcare providers and patients thought most clearly defined a flare of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, what's significant to me in looking at this aren't, isn't necessarily the specific factors, but how different they are. So you can see that patients and doctors both think pain and function most typically uh, define flare. But then there are other factors that are completely different on the two sides of the uh, roster. For patients, factors such as fatigue, participation, self-management are very important. Whereas for doctors, labs uh, and joint swelling tend to be more important features. But other than a few key overlapping factors, we see things very differently. And we both, we each bring something very different to that um, assessment. Next slide. So what did we do? We were gonna develop the guidelines for medication management. And the start of that process is um, a scoping meeting. We met with our core team, uh, about 17 or 18 content experts and two patients who'd undergone arthroplasty. During that session, we defined the scope of the project, what our guideline would actually address, and we, um, we defined the research questions 
into very specific uh, questions that our literature review team can then answer for us. So they take those specific research questions that that entire group of about 20, 25 people had uh, put together, reviewed thousands of uh, articles, and came out with the best um, summation of what, what data was actually available in the literature. And we did two things. First, we presented all of that data in a full day meeting to our patient panel. Now, our patient panel were all people who had undergone um, hip or knee replacement, and all of whom had either rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile idiopathic arthritis, but were adults. They then underwent a significant amount of training. Um, they attended about eight hours of training webinars including a webinar uh, about serving on a guideline panel. They went through the identical presentation and voting that our expert panel uh, also performed, but we took the results of their votes and I then presented them when I presented the data to the uh, expert voting panel. That panel then took the patient's uh, input and reviewed all of the data in the exact same fashion as the patients and came up with uh, a guideline. The guideline is now in the process of being both disseminated and implemented, and uh, it'll be a living structure, but um, right now we've got our, our, our current form. Next slide, please. So, when you have high quality evidence, you have very clear um, experimental evidence. We know from other experiences that patients reach the same conclusions of, as physicians and that you can come out with very strong recommendations. These tend to be things that uh, recommendations and interventions that will improve health for which there's little risk of adverse events. These will be convenient, they'll be low cost. Most patients would select this intervention, and most physicians would recommend it. These are very high quality, uh, strong recommendations. Next. However, patients' values and preferences are particularly helpful and important when the quality of the evidence isn't high. And that was the situation we found ourselves in. In that case, there's a real trade-off uh, between benefits and harms to the patient that are really closely balanced. When the quality of the evidence isn't high, uh, we produce con conditional recommendations. And what that means is that the majority of informed patients would follow the recommendations, but others would have very good reasons not to. Um, and recommendations in these situations are really much more uh, sensitive to patient values and preferences. And this is when the patient's perspective is going to have the strongest influence on both the direction and the strength of the recommendations. Next slide. So we realized that we needed to bring patients into this project, but what hasn't been well um, decided and what I don't think anyone has a complete uh, answer to is how do you incorporate patients into projects of this sort? One way is to include patients in uh, large panels as we did at our scoping meeting. But the sense was that patients in that sort of um, setting can feel drowned out. And the feedback we've gotten at the ACR is that they really don't feel empowered to speak up. The other question about incorporating several patients into a large panel is whether they'll truly be representative of a large group uh, of, of patients that would share the same problem. Another way of doing this would be to conduct focus groups. But it's not really clear what the best way is to uh, incorporate patient input. Next, please. So what we did with the patient panel when we met with them, in addition to presenting the literature, we elicited uh, their values and preferences. We wanted them to help us give weight to that balance between benefits and harms. And we wanted to specifically ask them about the relative importance
burden of infections compared to the importance of flares. When we went through the literature, although we'd originally hoped to include a lot of other outcomes in our guideline, we found that there was um, really no evidence that would let us uh, take that, um, those other factors and include in the guideline. One of the important things that we asked them to do was to really consider their personal experience relevant to those questions. We wanted them to judge the importance of the outcomes uh, based on their own experience. We thought one of the ways we use expert physicians' uh, input is to have them use their experience. And we thought that the patient's experience, particularly these, this group, all of whom had undergone arthroplasty, could use their experience as their evidence base, just the way physicians do. Now, having presented all the data, they strongly and unanimously felt that flares, which were very common, were far less important to them than infection. Next slide, please. We found that rather um, confusing, and during our patient panel day, uh, well, not confusing, but we wanted to understand it better. Um, they almost didn't have a, a high upper number when we asked them how much more uh, important infection was to them than flare. And it was 10 or 20 to 1. It was much, much more important. And when we explored what those factors were that made them uh, feel that way, they all felt that they understood flares, that flares were a known risk that they had experienced controlling, and they were accustomed to dealing with the flare, but they felt there wasn't an average infection. There was no such thing. There were bad infections. And because of their, um, the medications they took, they had the sense that any infection uh, put them at risk for a much worse outcome than any flare, which they were very well equipped to handle. Interestingly, they also expressed the feeling that the perioperative period was a job and that dealing with the flare was simply part of the hard work that they bought into when they undertook an arthroplasty. One of them even said, they, I always assume I'll be in a flare when I enter surgery and for a while when I come out, but I'm afraid of infection, which I thought was about as clear as it could get. And another patient said, I always expect to flare. So they really helped us understand how a common event like flaring, which patients with rheumatoid arthritis will describe as really an incapacitating event, was nonetheless of much less importance to them. Next slide. So in conclusion, we elicited uh, our patients' preferences prior to the decisions of the voting panel, and we presented the um, the opinions of the patient panel to the voting panel. I think our guideline demonstrated that patient input is of clear benefit, particularly in the presence of relatively weak evidence. And it really helped shape the direction and the strength of the decisions that were ultimately made by the physician voting panel. We thought that formally determining the values and preferences of the patients ultimately led to a patient-centric set of recommendations that were congruent for both patient and physician panels. The, um, the votes were identical for both groups. We felt that our findings on this project really supported the formal incorporation of information elicited from separately convened patient panels into clinical practice guidelines. So we were very, um, very pleased with the interaction and really the, the really useful information that we, uh, we were able to elicit uh, through this, this format. Next. Are there any questions? And does anyone out there have any this, with this gorgeous view of uh, HSS from the East River? Um, does anyone have any questions for uh, for Susan about the uh, incorporation of, of patient panels and patients into the, the process of, of developing treatment guidelines? That was really helpful. Thank you. 
Okay, and we'll um, we'll have time for more questions to uh, at, at the very end. Uh, so you know, feel free to again put it in the chat window or or speak up, and um, uh, we'll move to this next piece and then uh, and then circle back for more questions. So thank you very much, uh, Susan. That's really helpful. Really helpful. So. Uh, so so now that you've heard uh, about our development of the better said cohort of patients, uh, patient partners for joint replacement research, and also about a couple of examples where, where patients really are uh, vital to research, vital to evidence generation, vital to helping to determine how the evidence gets implemented in clinical care. Um, so we'll, we'll get to the next steps in just a minute, but first uh, let, let's recap a little bit, kind of a, a big picture of what we know what are some of our uh, take home points from this, uh, this project? So I'll turn it over to uh, my co-lead, uh, Tom Kincannon. Thanks, Ben. Um, and so as a result of having conducted this project over a period of uh, nearly two years now, um, and then um, as a result of, um, I think the experience we witness uh, in the two examples and uh, the experiences we witness in other PCORI projects, we understand now that patients can be effective partners in research. Um, and we do this for two reasons. Number one, it's just the right thing to do. Um, we use public dollars in research, and uh, in order to uh, be, good pub uh, be good stewards of uh, public dollars, um, we ought to um, be as democratic as possible in the use and uh, delivery of uh, products from those dollars and dissemination of information. But also, we understand that healthcare is a really you know, personal, uh, personal experience. And so uh, goods like justice, equity, the autonomy of individuals, self-determination, self these are values that we hold um, here in the United States and we talk about a lot. But uh, medicine is an area where um, we know we have lots more work to do. And so for just the intrinsic reasons of um, being good public stewards and uh, recognizing the personal nature of medicine. We want to, we want to involve part, uh, patients as partners in research. But we also know that doing so can potentially change research. And these are instrumental ends. Um, we think that by doing this, we could potentially make, uh, develop research questions that are more relevant for patients, that are more understandable, um, by uh, folks who need to use the evidence in decision making. And then really ultimately, and this is really the, um, the, the aspiration um, I think we all want in research is that um, it become more useful. Um, we'd like to see research that doesn't just line shelves and collect dust. And um, we'd like to see it be uh, research be more useful, not only by patients, but by the, all of the other stakeholder groups we think about insurers, clinicians, health systems, uh, and so on. Now, having this aspiration doesn't necessarily um, sort of close the loop for us. We need to know a lot more about exactly how we do this. And, and Susan, thank you for uh, speaking to, those, to these issues. We know that uh, to do this the right way, um, we need the commitment um, of all stakeholders who will come to research and be participants in research. Uh, to uh, be open to the uh, involvement of patients. It's hard, it's not easy, it's not natural for researchers and academic medical centers, but um, we need to develop the commitment on the part of all other stakeholders. Um, it, because it's not something we've been doing for a long time, um, it requires the training not just of patients, but other stakeholders. Um, and we are at the stage now, I think some 520 funded science projects from PCORI. Um, that number might not be exact, but, uh, and uh, work by NIH and by CBPR uh, funding across the federal government. We know that um, no single model yet is the right model for patient involvement. We're not certain exactly what to do, how to do, 
uh, in every single case. Um, so next slide. <clears throat> to begin answering some of these questions, I and a consortium of uh, uh, researchers, patients, and stakeholders from the United States, Canada, UK, and Australia um, have come together and begun to ask um, uh, uh, just this question, how do, we, how do we move forward? What is the most important next step? And um, uh, one of those next important steps has been uh, determining the path forward for individual research projects. We've begun to sketch out um, these seven guiding questions that researchers, these are aimed at researchers, could ask themselves uh, when starting a research project um, to sort of get set up to answer the question, how am I gonna involve patients and other stakeholders? Number one, how do you establish as a researcher a distinction between studying patients and involving patients in research? Two, um, I just talked about why we involve patients. Why do you think, uh, you know, we, uh, researchers can ask themselves this question. What are the ethical and scientific rationales for involving patients? Do you train patients before you get started? If so, how do you do that? Uh, does your team need training to work with patients as partners? What are the specific research activities in which you seek the involvement of patients? And I mean, before research gets started, uh, the formation of research questions, prioritization of research questions, and then during the research, the conduct of research, collection of data, interpretation of data. And then after um, evidence has been collected or, or developed, how do you then um, involve patients in the dissemination as ambassadors for the evidence? And so we're talking about how you involve patients in, uh, uh, in all stages of research across all phases. We also think uh, a useful question is at what level of intensity do you involve patients? Do you hire patients as staff members on your research project? Do you partner with patients as co-PIs? Do you put patients on your publications? Uh, do you um, consider patients as experts who could sit on an expert panel? or do you want a specialized patient expert panel? And then number seven, and this is really the holy grail here, what are the specifics of how you will interact with stakeholder groups? And next slide. This is a very challenging decision. And what I did here, uh, this does not come from data, but again, using the before, during, and after research um, uh, framework, um, I listed, um, just a sampling of the many choices researchers could make about how they will involve um, uh, patients in any one or all of these stages. Um, will you do this in groups or by individual, um, uh, individual by individual? Will you use telephone, email? Um, are patients going to be involved in actual document review? I'm just running around this word cloud here. And you can see um, the number of choices that you might make about involvement of patients before research, during, and after research is really dizzying. Back to Ben. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, so I'm just gonna go back to this slide here, the, the guiding questions as a sort of a example of a framework or a way we might think about uh, involving patients um, and other stakeholders. Um, and the focus of this webinar is really on how, how can patient partners improve research, especially in joint replacement, um, to improve safety, improve health outcomes uh, for patients. So we'll pause here this, uh, before we, we end with some next steps and what you can do as a researcher or what you can do as a patient uh, to, to get involved in these ways. Um, we'll end with that and sort of the big finish. Um, but before then, just wanted to take a few minutes to answer some questions and, and, and also pose a few questions. Um, so one question that came up, I think, I think Susan, uh, you raised it in your presentation, uh, sort of a question or concern that comes up uh, with patient panels and, you know, who to involve and how to involve them is this question of representativeness. So um, when you're you know, as we do for arthritis power, for example, we have a, a group of, of, of about 10 or so patient governors um, who, you know, speak in some ways on behalf of the whole broader patient community 
uh, people living with arthritis to make decisions about a patient-powered research network. Um, you know, we may strive for representativeness in some ways, but uh, I guess how do you how do you deal with that challenge? Um, what do people think or feel? You know, if you're a patient, if you're a researcher, uh, how do you address address those concerns or even the critique that uh, one patient or even a panel of patients may not be representative uh, or perfectly representative of of all patients um, across the the population? One of the specific problems we had in our panel was that although our guideline applied to patients with both rheumatoid arthritis and patients with systemic lupus, which were very different diseases, our patient panel was only comprised of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile arthritis. And they were very uncomfortable since they didn't feel they had an evidence base uh, to, with which they could speak for the patients with lupus. So I think representativeness is very important when you're trying to tap into a really um, kind of organic level of expertise. Um, and I don't know what the answer to that really is. I, I think it's something we're struggling with because having a small number of, of patients with any given uh, diagnosis involved is also not ideal because of because of the, the sort of flip side of that the empowerment um, so I, I think it's it is a big question and I think for something like a guideline that covers a broad range of diseases it's particularly challenging thanks Susan um, this is Chris and I was going to answer it from both a researcher perspective and a patient perspective um, perspective. From a research perspective, um, when I was in orthopedics research, I was, you know, doing um, my dissertation on hip research, and I thought it was very interesting when I looked at all the literature, it was knee and hip was combined so often, and I thought that was so strange because I thought the considerations for both um, populations were very different, the expectations of the surgery, the age group of the surgery, and I always found that um, interesting or strange that why would they be lumped together? Um, so I think it's very important to be looking at patient populations and the expectations and the goals of the surgery. Um, from a patient perspective, I'm a patient governor, um, as Ben said, and I represent an OA population for hip, but I'm also a patient who had a hip replacement from um, as a younger age. And so I feel like I can represent a younger age population and their decision-making expectations and concerns, but I recognize I can't really speak for an older population who is dealing with the decision of having a hip replacement. So um, I think it's important from a patient perspective to recognize what issues you bring, what potential biases you bring, what strengths you bring, but to also recognize what limitations you bring to your perspective and to be cognizant of that and to help um, let the researchers know that there is a gap in that knowledge so that they can help identify potential people to fill those gaps to get a more representative sample. And hi, this is Tom. Uh, this is um, perhaps the uh, the nut of the problem um, that we face in all stages of research and, uh, and uh, it affects um, this question of representativeness affects the, the um, you know, the selection of, of um, a method of interaction um, even. Um, so um, quite often we hear um, about um, prioritization, research prioritization activities um, being um, sort of publicly, uh, Ask, requ requesting public engagement through public comment periods. This is very difficult for um, you know, a minority patient voice to be uh, heard um, in a prioritization exercise that is going to uh, result in some consensus statement about what is the top priority by voting. Um, and so we need to think about um, you know, representativeness when we're using voting exercises and using public comment. In survey work, um, we often use survey work to get representativeness and we use a sampling methodology and so on. But again, here, um, the results of survey work are often presented as summary results, the mean result, the median result, drowning out the uh, results of unstable tails of the distribution in the, in the response. Um, 
And then um, a way to deal with that is often by intentionally um, using focus group uh, work. And once you understand what the range of um, you know, communities out there, including not only the, the clinical condition, but uh, racial and ethnic groups and um, uh, uh, disadvantaged groups economically and so on, focus groups can be a great way to go and, and amplify um, uh, uh, ideas and, and uh, preferences of, of minority opinion, uh, my, minority groups. Great, thanks Tom and Chris and then Susan for, for weighing in on this question of representativeness. So there's a few questions, uh, a few other questions that have come up in the chat window that I'll, I'll just pose here for the group. Um, uh, one question is, uh, that comes from Beverly and Beverly, feel free to, to chime in if I'm uh, not asking this correctly, but the question came from Beverly was how, how can patients or how, how do patients find out or how do they know if their device uh, used in the hip or knee replacement is a problem. Is there a protocol for that or is a website where they can check um, or do they just need to rely on their surgeon uh, or some other healthcare professional uh, to tell them that their device uh, might be a problem or it's a device that has been found to be a faulty device or be, been recalled or uh, required revisions um, you know, across a number of, of patients who, who receive that device. Um, so I don't know if there's any anyone on the call who has expertise in that area who could answer that, but I'll, it came from a patient, so I, I wanted to put it out there. Uh, ben, this is Linda Raddick. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, thanks, Linda, go ahead. Um, I think I've been through six hip replacement surgeries. <laughs> Just from my own experience, uh, thing I would say is that it's really hey, Linda, important. Linda, Linda, just yeah, to let you know, yeah. I think you're, you're cutting out just a little bit. I'm not sure uh, if you're on the phone or the computer, if there's um, a way to make sure to just that we let can me, hear let you. Let me get a bit, a clo bit closer and see if that helps. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, it's just really important for patients to get the information about their devices. and Typically, that has to be requested through a medical release information form from the hospital where the surgery took place. And very, be very specific in requesting the ID codes from the implant that was used. And once you have that, then you at least know what's in your body and can keep your ear to the rail. It is very unusual in my experience for doctors to actually know whether there are issues with devices. And even if there's some inkling, the quick response is typically, well, we don't really know what that means. And so for the patient to be very, very clear and, and forthright with what they're experiencing uh, in terms of the problems and the symptoms that they have with their hip or their knee is, is key. And then you, I've just done a ton of research I keep my ears to the rail on in the internet with various journals to see what comes up. Um, part of patient groups that can talk and share with each other what they learn and what they're experiencing. So that at the very least, the patient doesn't feel like they're crazy and they find that their, their symptoms, their experience with their device actually is validated by talking to others. Finding a doctor to deal with it, that can be a, another challenge. Thanks, Linda. That's fantastic. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Linda, a great patient advocate in in this area. So again, uh, if one of the bigger um, aims of this webinar and this project is to really engage research researchers to call on uh, patients like Chris, who you heard present, or Linda, who you just heard speak, to be a uh, patient partner in research. Um, you know, now you're, you're kind of getting the proof of the expertise uh, that's out there. Um, the field among patients. So I'd like to ask a related question that showed up in the chat window. Um, and this question um, is from Sampreet uh, Banerjee. I'm probably slaughtering the pronunciation, but in any event, the question is, um, is a great one about patient reported outcomes um, and comparative effectiveness research, and I'd even argue safety. So how can 
patient reported outcome measures uh, be used in de determining, determining the comparative effectiveness or the safety of devices that are used uh, in joint replacement? Um, and can that, can those data um, be found in registry data like the no. AJRR? Um, so is, is there anyone out there who can comment on, on that, on, on ways that we um, could do that? I know it's something Tom and I have talked about, um, you know, potentially doing with arthritis power, the power, the power that we have with the network to collect patient reported outcomes and linking that to clinical data collected by a surgeon um, or a hospital. But I, I think the question is then how can we find that for, uh, you know, a large number of patients in registry data? Uh, ben, this is Linda again. I'm aware of um, an organization that was created uh, by a person who used to work at the FDA and at CMS, and she has found a way to create a web uh, cloud-based program that takes the data from three different registry sources. Um, one, I think, is international. The other two are both U.S and in real time be able to run data searches on devices to find out where the reports are. Um, because what we have in our system is something that is so fragmented, it, one piece doesn't interact with the other. And because it's so volunteer, there's, you're getting an under-reporting more than likely. And when patients do it, often there is information that's needed that's not there because they don't know. So there's no way to assign their outcome to a particular device if they don't really know what that device was. Um, and and that, that organization is called Device Events. Uh, it's run by Madris Tomes. Um, it is a fee-based service, but it is something that um, organizations might, organizations, particularly researchers particularly, might want to look into how that can help them um, in their research and in using um, patient reported outcomes along with the data that's already there. Great, thanks, Linda. Um, I know Karen Etkin from the American Joint Replacement Registry. I saw her on the webinar earlier. I was hoping she could weigh in from the registry perspective, but I think, I think actually Tom um, here in the room and also um, Chris uh, had some comments on this or ideas as well. Uh, Tom? So I think this question um, is, again, it's just right on the spot here. Um, it's very, it's been uh, challenging for uh, the health systems performing these surgeries to collect perioperative patient reported outcomes a month before and up to six months after um, the surgery to understand what the patient's experience is with the surgery and recovery after surgery. Um, and so the truth is that these are not routinely collected in, in uh, clinical records. Um, and um, I think there are potential solutions to this problem. Um, one of them may not be um, that we force health systems to do this because of the uh, extent of it. I don't know, but, um, but it, the extent of the challenge is uh, close to a million surgeries a year. Um, and that the cost of collecting patient reported out outcomes in person can be quite expensive. Um, a potential solution is to create a registry of patient reported outcomes. Um, using, um, uh, there are lots of experiments happening now with smartphone uh, based reporting, um, with, um, uh, you know, sort of Fitbit type uh, passive reporting. And so on, and to, to begin collecting registry data that way, um, directly from the patients in real time, uh, from their uh, the convenience of their home or their work, and so on, um, and then begin to link th those data up with clinical registry, clinical data in the health setting, or with uh, registry data like AJRR. Um, so that's just a thought, but I think we're way off, and we have uh, lots of experimentation to do. Okay, great, thanks, Tom. But there's at this point we have ideas for how we could do that. We just need to actually implement a few of those projects to figure out what works or how best to do that. Chris? Oh, and, and I was gonna say the good news is that orthopedics is one of the fields that has been um, using PROs um, for a longer time than a lot of other specialties. 
And I think one of the things that'll be important to address this very important issue is that many orthopedic surgeons are using PROs, but there is little consistency in what instruments are being used and the time points at what they're being collected. So obviously you need a pre-operative one and you need post-operative PROs to measure the success of the surgery. But then we also need to know if a device is failing, at what point do we think a device is going to fail? Like if we think um, a device is going to fail, are we going to pick that up at a year? Then we need to look at PROs that go out at a year. You know what I mean? To identify, can PROs help pick that up? And then if there could be some consistency at what measures we're looking at and then to ensure that um, PROs that are used are all like validated and not just looking at a satisfaction score or a pain score, but you know, are we using validated scores that can be kind of compared to one another so we can look at a large group of patients rather than comparing apples to oranges. So I think those are some important questions too. Great. Thanks, Chris. So we have time, I think, for one or two more questions before um, before our kind of final uh, wrap up with our next steps and what you can do as a researcher or, uh, or a patient to get involved um, in this area. Um, a question that also came up in the chat window, um, I, I don't know that everyone saw it because I think it might have been private to me. And so, Denise, uh, I might have you chime in to help frame this question a little bit. Okay. Um, and I, to be honest, I'm not sure there's expertise on the on the webinar here to answer your specific question, but it sounds like you were recently told that uh, joint replacement, like knee replacement surgery, is considered by the insurance company to be elective, and you yes. you wondered about the you wondered about the implications of that, both for research and for clinical care. Um, does that change things if, if surgery or joint replacement is considered an elective surgery? How does that affect care? How does that affect uh, the research we do on that. Um, does anyone have any uh, responses to that? Um, Chris, actually here, um, will kick us off. Um, most often in the literature, they do refer to it as an elective procedure. But what um, I learned is that when I was doing my research for my dissertation, is that there are several conditions they call preference sensitive conditions. And hip replacement and knee replacements are considered a preference sensitive condition. Another one, another condition that's considered a preference sensitive condition, which I think is a better term than elective, is something like um, early stage breast cancer, where some people mm -hmm. choose to have surgery and some people choose to have not. So it's kind of like where a patient choice comes more into play into treatment. So I think preference sensitive condition is a more accurate, accurate term rather than elective so but i know um yes a lot of people do consider it elective in the sense that it's not a live or die surgery but i will be interested to see and there's other uh, preference sensitive conditions i can't remember the whole list um because i know you do need justification many times from an you know an insurance company that you have failed pt and those different um, issues before you can get the surgery. Not that I'm an, an expert on that. Um, I just know that many times it's how it is referred to, but in another way is preference sensitive condition. So I would urge you to look that up because I think that will also change how things are researched, especially in terms of now we are looking at comparative effectiveness research and patient-centered outcomes research, that that will be an important distinction. Yeah, yes, you know, question. Oh, go ahead. No, Yes, no, I was just going to um, add that, um, you know, I do understand it because I did work for a health plan, so I understand basically how a lot of times it has to go through approval. I think I just wanted to put it out there because, um, you know, for the future, if we're doing, if research is happening, if people are considering um, joint replacement, you know, everyone isn't going to be as educated as we may be or have the knowledge. So um, I was just kind of putting it out there, Ben. You know, I, that's why I had asked you or sent it privately because I wasn't sure if it was for this forum, but just wanted to just, you know, make a mention of it. So um, it is, a, I think it's a concern, that's all. Yeah, thanks for raising that concern and asking. And it's something that we can also follow up with um, mm -hmm. offline, but it's, it's an important issue. Um, 
so so what can we do so what are the next steps here um to to get we started with the question um can or how can patient partners improve joint replacement research so if you're a researcher out there uh how can you involve patients as partners to study joint replacement? Um, a couple things that we suggest or will propose is that, first of all, we have created this better said cohort um, with support from PCORI in the course of this two year engagement award. Um, and it's a resource for you. It's, it's sitting ready to be tapped into. Um, so we would be delighted if you would contact me, you have my email address there. Um, and let us know, or you know, you can call Creaky Joints or Global Healthy Living Foundation, and let us help link you with patient partners uh, who are ready to to work with you uh, on a research team um, in in studies in this area. Um, the other way uh, is to, and and this could all, of course be kind of the same phone call or email to us, is to partner with patient powered research networks like Arthritis Power. Uh, so we just heard um, a couple of minutes ago a question about how can or how are patient reported outcomes uh, being used to conduct comparative effectiveness or safety studies? Well, we collect patient reported outcomes. Uh, we use those kinds of measures within arthritis power. We have the, the library of NIH developed promise measures. Um, we use a, a tool that's quite common in rheumatology called the RAPID3 uh, that's used as a measure of disease activity, for example. Um, and we can uh, load other tools into our, our uh, into our library of patient reported outcome tools if there's something that's specific or unique to a particular clinical setting. Um, so we're uh, we're here, we're ready that we have these two resources: the Better Said cohort of patient partners and and the Arthritis Power Research Network that um, that we we want research researchers out there to know about and to partner with us um, to do this kind of work. What about if you are a patient and um, you want to get involved as a research partner? So the whole point of Better Said was to, to bring those people into the fold, uh, provide some training, um, some, some concepts and thinking around this. Um, one way that moving forward, if you're not already involved, is to become a patient partner in research with Creaky Joints. Uh, we provide training and some activation and regular updates in this area. Uh, Shilpa. Um, you have her contact information there. She conducts a research 101 session, always co-facilitated with a patient partner. And that's a great way to, to get yourself on the radar with us and to get some training and background um, so you're prepared to sit at, at the table on a research team. Um, and of course, to you know, get involved with, with patient-powered research at Arthritis Power, um, being part of that research network also uh, you know, kind of plugs you into the, the kind of emails and updates, uh, studies that, that, we're, uh, that we're working on um, and helps you become more aware of, of just research in general in this area, orthopedics and rheumatology. Um, so with that, we uh, were thrilled uh, and delighted that so many people joined uh, for the discussion today for this webinar. Um, thank you very much uh, for your time. We um, we uh, would like to let you know that, again, we recorded this webinar and we'll make it available on our Creaky Joints website. We'll send a follow-up email with information um, and a link to this uh, webinar, the recording, once it's been posted. Um, and we would hope that you would please share that with people that you know. And we look forward to hearing from you to connect patient research partners with joint replacement or arthroplasty uh, research projects that are going on. Thanks again for your participation and have a great day. Thank you, Ben.